Hello and welcome to part 2 of 3. Convoy War and the Perfect Storm of PQ-17, Ships of the Convoy War. Now, I've actually covered quite a lot of these topics before, and these ships before, so I'm going to be, mm, to an extent, quick. But I still want to do it because it's always good to make sure there is a level, and there are some more information about trawlers, etc., which would be quite cool here. Now, a lot of researchers are asleep, and for those who are wondering why I am wearing this lovely, lovely flea, uh, um, hoodie that my girlfriend sent me, there may have been a bet about whether or not I would ever actually wear it on a video. You will know who made the bet, because they will also have to do something similar. Hello. Hello. You decided you want to come there into the video. So, here we go. No, you cannot eat the fluffy toys. They're my fluffy toys, not your fluffy toys. So, right, you're going to stay there. Right. HMS Lotus and HMS Ayrshire. Now, I've picked out these two examples, and then we're going to look at the generic four structure uh, of the uh, ships of the Convoy War. But let's consider HMS Lotus. She was commissioned in May 1942 and was assigned to escort duty in the Arctic Convoy route. In June, she sails with PQ-17. She'd only been commissioned a month, less than a month. when she is sent into <laughs> the perfect storm that is the Arctic Wharf, uh, Arctic Convoy route. And, you know, after the convoy scatters, she takes part in the search and rescue um, to try and, you know, find people who've gone down to try and recover people. She does a lots of things. She even has a bit of a post-war career. Um, she becomes the merchant vessel Southern Lotus after World War II and is uh, used as a boy tender and later a whaler. She's a cool ship. But she had been... Well, she's launched on the 16th of January 1942 and originally named HMS Phlox. Renamed in April 1942 as after HMS Lotus, the original one, was transferred to the Free French Navy, and she's commissioned, as I said, in May 1942. If you take back the average building time, she'd been ordered in 1941. She's one of the last, last cat of flower class to be ordered for the Royal Navy and to enter service. After this, the Royal Navy goes on to slightly bigger, tougher corvettes and frigates. But she's going to be critical. You know, they uh, get do get credited. She gets credited with a couple of kills of submarines in her career, although there has been post-war analysis which has changed some of that. But, you know, she did all these things. And she escorted... Uh, she's a very small little ship, but she does a lot. And she's a good example of what was escorting the convoy. Now, the other one I have, and I'm doing this left-handed because I currently have... A puppy dog. <sighs> Trying to get a lot of fuss. So, HMS Asia. She's completed in February 1938 as a regular trawler. 
She's not part of a specific class. She's like most of the trawlers taken up from trade. She's... This space is 540 tons. She's armed with a 4-inch gun. And she's returned to her, her owner in October 1945. Renamed Macbeth in 1946 and scrapped at Dalmuir on 1st of January 1967. During World War II, she would be commanded by Frank Blake, Nigel Dixon, James Renwick, Leo Joseph Anthony Gra uh, Gradwell, who you're going to hear a lot about, Robert William Hillary Elson, Norman Kingsley Baines, William Gilbert Nigel Alplin. And they go R&R, one RN, a sub-lieutenant, Nigel Dixon. Then R&R, then RNVR, starting with Gradwell, then RNVR with Elson, RNVR with Baines, and R&R again with Applin. So, you can tell she's a small ship, she's a small command, and she has a relatively junior officer in command for her. She has one four-inch gun, and she has some depth charges. She takes part in lots of operations and lots of exercises. Because she's a critical little ship. And all these little ships are critical. That's why I did the... Um, I've done the videos I have done on not big ships and all these things. Because they are critical ships for fighting World War II. Now. So let's look at an overview of the flower class. And yes, this is again... A, a, a slide I've used elsewhere, but it works. Engines. Well, the engines are variable on the flower class. They're what's available. The roughly they produce a top speed of 16 knots and a range of three and a half thousand nautical miles at 12 knots, so they can keep up with their merchant vessels. However, and interesting enough, this was confirmed by further sources, which came forward after I had um, done my previous video on these. There are examples of flower class corvettes reaching more than 16 knots. They don't really have the hull form for it. They're rather short and fat. Their hull form is for maneuverability, not for size speed. But there are some not quite verifiable claims of 20 knots being achieved by some of their number. And I have heard in the past, and will be fairly confident saying that I know that I could... Everything but prove in an academic sense, i.e. with multiple references, 18 knots. So 20 knots wouldn't surprise me considering the variable engines put in them and the care and attention the engineers gave their crews. Because, okay, quite a lot of the Corvettes, quite a lot of the small ships of the convoy war of world war ii were manned by reservists now regular Na royal navy and regular naval personnel are known for adapting their equipment reservist personnel are even more inclined to do that because often they are a mix of if you're talking about Royal Navy Reserves, of merchant sailors who have years and years of experience and rather eccentric, eccentric people who are highly passionate about the sea and have lots of interesting ideas. Also, you often have quite a lot of these people have independent means in terms of the officers, sometimes in terms of the petty officers, and are quite financially well off. Unable to go 
Uh, so, we're in America. Oh, that's nice. We've come here for a visit of convoy. There's no rationing. Oh, you can find all these parts. Oh, that would be good for my engine. It costs this much, sir. Yes, put it in now. So, um, yeah. The more and more you study the convoy war, the more and more you look at the ships of the Royal Navy in this period, the more and more you start to feel sympathy for those people who were with the Great White Fleet, etc., trying to get fleet evolutions to work because they were so um, different. It seems to me that if I was the... If I had been a U-boat um, commander, the last thing I would expect to face would be a stock flower class corvette or stock crawler. There are the figures which they are, have started out their career with, and there are the figures of which they are now capable and have been adapted by their crew, because they do become little crew projects. It's, you know... Displacement, 940 tons, 1,031 tons for the modified and all these things. 85 for the original, 90 for the modified. Their radars and these things, they're all, to an extent, standardized. Okay? Engines, modified. Guns, weapon systems. Well, 4-inch is the biggest they're going to have fitted on. And anti-submarine mortar. And yes, they're were actually officers who came with tactics for using their anti-submarine mortar and their four-inch gun to take on surface raiders. Um, thankfully, something the fluffy reef search assistant wouldn't ever do, I'm sure, even though he is named for Sir Walter Raleigh. So there's no fine tradition in the British um, sailor ship for modifying your ship and hunting down your enemy. Now... The thing was, when it comes to light guns, in one case, potentially one of those anti-aircraft rocket launchers which got taken off the battleships, because they were found to be terrible, but there is a report that one... Corvette might have changed its four-inch gun for one of those at one point just to see what how it would be like. But leaving that to one side, I, I, I am very skeptical of that one. That seems a whole lot of policing. They liked their four-inch gun. It was far more versatile than the rockets were. But it's 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 a report I read recently. Got sent to me. Um but in terms of machine guns and 20mm Orlicons, 40mm cannon, as many depth charges as they could carry. Now, theoretically, the, mo the regular flower class have 40 and the modified flower class have 70 depth charges. But, and I say this knowing there are many options which could be the case. They could have been signing for more to pass them on to other people who couldn't be there to sign them or something. Uh, but I have found a fair number of occasions where regular flag class Corvettes are signing out 60. They could be passing them on to trawlers. That could be why they're signing for them, but. Surely the trawlers were designed for their own, two dozen. And modified 80 or so. So I'm thinking they were trying to take as many depth charges as they could. And we won't even get into the number of rounds that they would try and carry for their hedgehog anti-submarine mortar. Because, honestly, it's just... It's... They're mobile Armageddon. That's all. That's what they're going for. 
Right, so some tidbits about the flower model cl modified class. Let's consider the time it takes them to get in service, okay? HMS Coriopis was ordered on 25th July 1939, was the first fire class to be laid down on the 19th of September 1939, and commissioned on the 17th of August 1940. Build time of 333 days. It's most of a year. Flower class is by no means a complicated ship. It still takes a year to build. So, the escorts you have at the beginning of the war versus the escorts you have at the end of the war are different. But in the nicest way, for about the first year, you're going to be fighting with the escorts you had at the beginning of the war. And you're not going to really have to start have these coming into service in proper numbers till 1941. And in 1942, they're still rolling off. So when we start talking about oh, the impact of frigates, the impact of this or castle-class corvettes and these sort of things, they take time to enter into service. They do. They take time. So you can't snap your fingers and just produce ships. And this affects convoy grouping and convoy organization and the kill ratios. If we can go back to that earlier slide, in from part one when we look at the vessels being sunk by u-boats the fact is you have more of those being sunk at the times when escorts are at their lower points i already committed elsewhere and are overstretched that does affect because that affects the number of escorts on convoys it has a cumulative impact Cumulative impact is dealt with by bringing in as many of these vessels as you possibly can. And that is what the Royal Navy is trying to do. One of the last flowers is actually built in 330 days. So they managed to, by building lots and lots of them, shave three days off their construction time. That's how simple and bare bones their construction really is. But their credit is being involved in as many as 52 sinkings of Axis submarines. So now we have trawlers, which were what filled a lot of the gap. And this is actually a class of trawler. And this is to make the point that Atrium's air share with her figures is not that unusual. A four inch gun or a quick firing 12 pounder. Three 20 millimeter Oricon AA guns and 30 depth charges. Now, air share has depth charges, machine guns, and the four inch gun. I don't think she has the Oricons. Not at this point, anyway, in 1942. Displacement, around the same. These ones, the class which were built, which we're talking about, this 545 tonnel, were theoretically mainly for harbour defence. That's what the Royal Navy was talking about getting them for. Um, but they were used for anything that was going, really. Any operation needed them, they would go. And they were used a lot. Because that's 200 vessels. And if we go back again to part one. A hundred and seventy five warships will be lost during, by the Allies during the Battle Atlantic. That's 200 warships. You can't afford not to use them. This, however, is the theoretical ocean going trawler size. 843 tons, so not that far off um, uh, a flower class corvette, but it's 
Speed is only 12 and a half knots, so it's only half a knot faster than the other trawlers. Only half a knot faster than their share. And a few more depth charges. Actually, technically, more depth charges than a original Corvette. Original flag class. Officially, more depth charges. So useful little ships. And they were useful little ships, but this is the point. The convoy war is mostly about the little ships. And if you go back to the first picture, Bob, these are little ships. And I was making the point about surface raiders. About, sorry. About how surface raiders are a critical impact upon the convoy war. These ships are not capable of taking on a surface raider. They might try with their anti-submarine mortar and their four-inch guns, but they'll be swept aside. That's the destroyer's job. And even they're not really up to and they're not really for the task. What is for the task? Well, that's the cruisers, that's the battleships, that's where they're supposed to come in. And this is where it becomes a problem, because where are they waiting? Where are they positioned? Where do they have air support? Where do you have escort carriers? All these things matter. And that is the reality of PQ-17. It is at the point at which, before a lot of those things come into service in enough numbers to really make a difference. It's at an intersection point. So, Twitter, at AC underscore Naval History, Patreon, AC Naval History, and Global Maritime History. Hope you enjoyed, hope you found it useful, and hope the idea is working. Do you want to say hello to everyone? You just want to be patted, do you? Okay, all right. He doesn't want to appear on camera, he just wants to be patted this morning. No, you just want to pull me. Can come up and say hello to everyone for a few weeks. As you're going to sit there and make noise and hello, you. I'm not sure why he's feeling bashful today. Right. He's up with me because there's lots of noises going on. So he feels safer up here. But you want the full bed rather than my lap. I feel spurned. Anyway, take care. Hope you have a nice day. Thank you to all the kind messages I've been receiving about um, the incidents we've been having. Hopefully they will be dealt with now. Hopefully now there's no scuffling and there is no... We're sorting out some other things. It will stop all the incidents and we won't have any more problems. But thank you to all the messages and the profferings of waiting outside my house with a crossbow. That was very kind. Very specific, but very, very kind. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a nice day.